Hi guys, I'm Marcus Taylor, veterinarian of six years, and today we are going to talk about the new euthanasia bill, which has been passed through Parliament and it's gone to referendum. Now unfortunately there is not a lot of understanding or education around this topic, so I'm going to help you guys bring some information to you. As a veterinarian I have a lot of experience with euthanasia, obviously with animals, not humans, but I'm going to interview a fantastic doctor of over 30 years, her name's Dr. Catherine Spencer-Taylor. So hold on to your undies, controversial subject. There's gonna be some really challenging issues raised in this interview, enjoy. Catherine, would you mind telling us a little bit about the bill? Yes, the bill has been narrowed down and modified in many, many ways, but basically says that anyone who's only expected to live for another six months will be able to call on euthanasia to shorten their life. Do you feel like the public are adequately educated about euthanasia to be the ones to vote and decide if this is something that's going to be made legal in New Zealand or not? I think the public really survive on stories and anecdotal accounts of relatives who have had suffering and chosen to end their lives. I think the public doesn't feel they have the time to educate themselves properly to make a, an informed vote on this issue. Okay. okay, so how about we do that a little bit. Um, how do you think this bill, first of all, is going to affect the medical field and the doctors? We got into medicine to help people um, live a better life rather than to end their lives. Would the euthanasia bill compromise any of your codes of conduct or things that you've sworn at university? Do you feel like it could be compromising the whole reason that some of these professionals got into the industry? Well, yes, as I said before, most of us, all of us hold to the Hippocratic Oath and uh, that mainly involves swearing that you'll do the best by your patients and first and we'll do them no harm and we'll administer no poisons and we'll, we'll give them nothing that will end lives. So in other words you you have sworn an oath that says you will not give patients something that will end their lives. Is that is that what you're saying? Part of our oath is to do no harm. First do no harm is, uh, there's a paraphrase in there that's essentially um, could be interpreted as first do no harm so Yes. Do you think, could there be a counter argument that um, ending someone's life doesn't qualify as harm if they're in a state of immense suffering and pain? Uh, plenty of doctors give um, narcotics and other pain relievers to relieve suffering at, towards the end of life. However, none of us give it with a view to ending their life. Um, the type of drugs that are used with euthanasia result in death within minutes. The type of drugs we administer for pain relief and for comfort are not euthanasia in another form. They're there completely to um, alleviate suffering, not to end a life. Right, so I don't know, and I'm sure people in the public don't actually know what, what's involved. Is it a pill that the doctor hands to the person and they take, or is it an injection, or do you know what methods that they use in other countries and what we would do here in New Zealand? I know there are intravenous infusions that are set up um, with toxic substances, and um, there's also tablet forms, so I'm not sure what form it would take. And would it be the doctors the New Zealand doctors who would be signing off and administering these drugs, or do you think they'd have to hire foreign doctors or in something like a death squad to come in and to administer these drugs and to be signing it because people aren't going to want that on their conscience? Uh, I, uh, the family doctor will not be the first port of call as far as I can tell from the doctor's opinions on the matter. It sounds as though there will have to be external doctors who are totally um, disconnected from the patient and their family to, to administer these drugs, much like a death squad that they have in, say, Holland. Right. So do you think there's a potential for people who are disabled or really sick to, or even just elderly, to be in a state of fear that they may be euthanised 
I mean, I've heard stories about um, elderly people in Europe <clears throat> in countries where it's legal wearing bracelets saying do not euthanize because they're afraid that something's going to happen to them. They're not going to be able to speak for themselves and a family member or a doctor is going to end their life. Um, do you think that there's potential for fear once this bill comes through in, in, in people who are vulnerable? Well, the disabled community are already speaking up against the bill because they realise that this is like the thin edge end of the wedge and this bill is going to, if it introduces euthanasia, it will certainly expand the parameters. In Holland, they've started to introduce euthanasia for children uh, where prior to that it was inconceivable that somebody below 18 would be euthanised. So we certainly believe that this is the beginning and much harm will be done. Is there the potential for people who are really sick and requiring a lot of really expensive government funded medical care and a lot of support from family to feel guilty for not choosing euthanasia and putting all of this stress and expense on their country and on their family? Do you think there's going to be this kind of thing of, oh, I just need to put myself out of people's way and not cost not cost, not hassle these doctors and hassle my family members because I'm really sick. The the honourable thing for me to do is to allow myself to be euthanised. Do you think there's any potential for for sort of guilt associated with not choosing euthanasia? I absolutely believe that families um, will put pressure on the elderly and the disabled to make that choice. I for financial reasons and for convenience reasons for their lives. Um, I believe they'll be very vulnerable, the elderly. They already are um, victims of much abuse and neglect and it, it's just an easy step to persuading them that euthanasia is a better path for them. So there's certainly elder abuse opportunities. There's also, um, for those who are disabled, they will undoubtedly make the choice to end their lives and uh, when they become depressed, and that happens quite a lot with my severely disabled patients, that they they say life's not worth living and they have taken steps to end their lives already. So if this euthanasia opportunity were around, I believe they will take it. And yet, when they come out of the depression, they believe life is worth living again. So all sorts of um, unfortunate decisions will be made when depression is an element of the decision too. It seems strange to me in a time where we have a really bad rate of youth suicide and suicide in our country that we're implementing more methods for people to end their lives and to think about that. Um, is palliative care good enough to alleviate suffering without euthanasia? Yes, yeah, since I was first, uh, a G when I first became a GP in the 1980s, we certainly were disorganised in our approach towards the end of life and I think there was, I saw unnecessary suffering for um, terminally ill people and, and it was sad. Right. However, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years our palliative care has really improved and the ability to look after people towards the end and keep them very comfortable and uh, attend to all their needs, physical, spiritual, mental um, has vastly improved and I cannot for the life of me understand what the argument is about. Perhaps it's based on the one in a thousand person whose um, pain cannot be con adequately controlled. I, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'm a, mentioned I'm a veterinarian and been practicing for six years. I can say it's very different putting down a cow to putting down a 14 year old Labrador with crying children and crying parents, um, the dogs often are treated like family members and it's really hard on the family and it's really hard on the vets and I often see vets coming out of the consult room just bawling their eyes out and you know it's, it's very hard especially when you have to do it three or four times in one day. So I can only imagine the pain involved with being the person that um, essentially puts down a human and the emotional consequences of that, because I can say personally as a vet, it's very hard. And I actually, one of the reasons I don't do companion animal practice anymore and, and prefer to do rural practices, because I found it really hard to, to do that um, and to deal with that. 
that pain and that suffering, how do you think the mental health of doctors would be affected if they were having to be involved in ending people's lives and making that decision? Probably the doctors who would be involved will burn out within a short amount of time. I can't see that anyone with any human feelings could do that job for very long without feeling awfully guilty and awfully um, mentally unwell. So I would anticipate that they would only be able to manage to do that job for 6 to 12 months and then they'll be out. Mm. We definitely have a huge rate of burnout in the veterinary industry, especially companion animal vets, um, and most of it is to do with mental health. Thank you very much for your time, Dr Spencer Taylor, and is there anything you would like to add um, before we finish? Just um, that I would beg the public to educate themselves further and, and don't rely on a couple of stories and a, a feeling that the, if this were happening to me, I would certainly choose to end my suffering earlier rather than wait and take its natural course. That That is a basis for a referendum is, is hopeless, so please have a look at the both sides and choose wisely. Okay, thank you very much.